I've got an idea for a TV show, and here's my pitch. You get some unknown wrestlers, or one of the best wrestlers on the planet, pair them up with a bunch of main roster guys, have them do matches in front of an audience who doesn't care, do silly challenges that make them look stupid, all the while the lead commentator buries the wrestlers for being rubbish and the viewers at home for being marks. And in the process, the only guy who truly gets over is the guy that was already the best wrestler on the planet. And when that season is unsuccessful, we'll learn no lessons and do the same thing with another one. And when that inevitably fails, we'll do a version where we care even less, move it to an online-only show, and somehow care about it even less than we did previously. Sounds like a great way to build new stars, right? Eventually, the letters NXT would mean what they were originally supposed to be, and would actually act as a beacon of light and hope for WWE fans in the mid to late 2010s. But the game show era of NXT is this bizarre piece of WWE history, and one that fans have lamented, poked fun at, and wondered what might have happened if Super Cena didn't win that one match at SummerSlam 2010. But how did this bizarre game slash reality TV show become the beloved black and gold brand of WWE? Who really killed? the original NXT. Chapter 1 – The Death of WWE ECW and Season 1 as we covered in our Who Really Killed WWE CW video, go click the link in the description to check that out, WWE's pathetic attempt to capitalize on the nostalgia of the beloved 90s wrestling promotion was cancelled in late 2009, after Vince McMahon and executives from Sci-Fi decided that the show was no longer working. It had lost over half of its audience and bore no resemblance to the iconic ECW that it was based upon. They tried nothing and were all out of ideas. Two weeks before its final episode, McMahon announced that ECW was coming to an end and would be replaced with NXT, which he called not only the next evolution of WWE, but also the next evolution of television. Speaking with Variety in February 2010, McMahon argued ECW feels old, it feels tired. Sometimes our brands need refreshing up. You have to continue to reinvent yourself. The idea was to do the next evolution of WWE's previous MTV reality show, Tough Enough, where wrestlers learned what it took to be a WWE star. The show would feature rookies being mentored by pros and eliminated until there is only one winner left standing who would then get a title shot of their choosing. In that Variety article, NXT was described as a first for WWE, essentially lifting the veil of how the company operates. McMahon is quoted as saying, there is an opportunity to show another side you've never seen. These kids crash and burn a lot. By putting them into this environment, we'll find out if they can make it. There's no better way to develop skills than being in front of an audience. And that makes for good television. Fun fact, WWE got into some trouble using the NXT name as it was already being used by a Glasgow-based wrestling promotion, Scottish Wrestling Alliance. They'd be using NXT for several years for their own development group. WWE got in touch and SWA renamed their NXT to Source and WWE were allowed to use NXT for themselves. I'm sure it was a nice conversation because, as we all know from NXT UK, WWE loved to play ball with UK-based wrestling promotions. LOL. Anyway, WWE were making their final choices for the rookies and the pros for this first season of NXT, which clearly changed just before it started. MVP was originally announced as Skip Sheffield's pro, but that was changed to William Regal before the show's debut. It was reported that both Daniel Bryan and Low Key were going to be part of this first season lineup, and it was even reported that WWE hadn't finalized how the show would actually work until it was taped. There was talk of it being a full on reality show, an interactive show with audience participants participation, and even a science fiction storyline show with conspiracies and things like that. By the second week of NXT, WWE had decided to ditch the audience vote, and rookies would be eliminated by pro vote, reportedly so they could control who won. Wade Barrett would later say, when I first heard the idea, I didn't like it. I thought it was like a total divas kind of reality show. I thought it was going to be a bunch of us living outside the ring and being followed around, which I didn't like at all. Chris Jericho, who was his pro, said that he turned 
turned down doing the show initially, saying, we were working four days a week as it was, and that's an extra day five days on the road a week, which at the time was not something that happened. I was also a bad guy at the time. I was like, why would I care about anyone else enough to be on this show? And why would I care about a rookie? Vince basically said, whatever, you're doing it. So I went into it reluctantly because it was an extra day of work I did not want. At first, I wasn't the happiest guy about it. Jericho and Regal were joined by R-Truth, Matt Hardy, Christian, CM Punk, Carlito, and The Miz as the pros, who mentored Barrett, Brian, Heath Slater, David Otunga, Justin Gabriel, Darren Young, Michael Tarver, and Skip Sheffield, who would later be rebranded as Ryback. While the partnerships of the rookies and pros ultimately did not matter, fans were skeptical of NXT early doors due to one of those partnerships in particular. Rookie Daniel Bryan being mentored by Pro the Miz. Brian Danielson had signed with WWE in August the previous year, working down in FCW and a few dark matches on Monday Night Raw under his real name. However, WWE changed that leading into NXT, other names included Buddy Peacock and Lloyd Bonaire, and despite winning the Wrestling Observer Best Technical Wrestler Award every year since 2005, he was paired with The Miz as a way to rile up the internet marks and start a storyline of him being disgruntled with NXT and WWE as a whole. Michael Cole, whose gimmick was being the Miz's number one fan, also turned on Brian, making fun of him for being small, skinny, a vegan, and for wrestling on the independents like a loser. He would say that no one's ever heard of him, he's got no personality, and even said on one episode, look at him, he's deformed. The season's first storyline was that, even though Brian lost all of his matches, the other pros ranked him as number one. He was, however, eliminated first alongside Michael Tarver, as WWE management didn't believe either wanted to win badly enough. He cut a promo saying that Brian Danielson would come back instead, narrator, he did not, and he shot an angle where he attacked both The Miz and Michael Cole. It's been debated for years just how much of this was intentional by WWE to create drama and storylines, arguing that Brian got over because the heels in Cole and Miz pushed so hard against him, and those that feel that Brian was being intentionally buried by WWE to annoy the internet marks. And he got over in spite of WWE's lack of faith in him. Miz would argue, I thought it was genius to pair me with Brian. Everyone hated me in the WWE universe, and he was the beloved independent wrestler, the king of the independents. He was loved by all the WWE enthusiasts, even though he'd never been in WWE. Brian, on the other hand, argues, some people will say that Michael Cole's commentary helped me. It was never intended to help me. It was borderline insulting. The NXT experience was very frustrating because they had us doing a lot of things that, to me, were just goofy. It should be noted that Cole wasn't just mean about Brian. The whole show was mean about all of the rookies for the most part. The first thing on the first episode was The Miz running down each of them for their appearances and lack of charisma. Wrestling tradition suggests that you should try and hide weaknesses in debuting wrestlers and accentuate their positives. But NXT was the opposite of that. It felt to many watching that this was all of the worst traits of a McMahon-led product that had no strong competition. The whole show felt like it was going out of its way to embarrass its rookies. By the seventh episode, the show moved away from in-ring competition and made the wrestlers do humiliating challenges like carrying a beer keg in a time trial or cutting a promo on random subjects on the fly. So Luke, in, in that talk, talk the talk segment. Talk the talk. Do, do you want to know the, the, the topics they got? I only really know the one from the second series because that's the famous mustaches promo. Right, yeah. So originally, Wade Barrett's topic for 30 seconds was blasé. Blase. <laughs> That's easier to do than blase. He did not do that. <laughs> Heath Slater got cereal. Yeah, that's also easily done. <laughs> Michael Tarver got itchy. <laughs> I don't know, you just start talking about the Simpsons. Skip Sheffield got rainbows. He did not mention rainbows at all. <laughs> David Otunga got sleep. Yeah. Which is right. Darren Young got toothpaste. <laughs> And shockingly, Daniel Bryan got action and didn't do the promo. And he was like, oh, I'm just, oh, I'm not going to say anything. Daniel Bryan, I'm London. And then stopped. That is so, that is Bryan taking the piss out of that whole thing. Uh, it was a tie in the crowd vote between Skip Sheffield and Wade Barrett. Uh, then they had to do a, a tie break round. So they have to go again. Skip Sheffield got bubble gum. And Wade Barrett got wind, which is where he said... The winds of change are blowing throughout WWE, and that became his signature move. The winds of change! 
that's where it came from. Very good. The more you know, the more you know everyone. To some viewers, NXT was less about finding a new star and more about WWE getting a moment that could go viral on Twitter. According to reports, WWE really only had interest in two of the rookies, Wade Barrett, the eventual winner, and David Otunga, because he had a good look and was the husband of Jennifer Hudson. But much like the Daniel Bryan conversation, it can be debated just how much of this was intentional in trying to build a storyline that these rookies rejected the idea of WWE and formed together as a united front to destroy it. Chapter 2 Nexus and Season 2 At the end of the June 7th edition of Monday Night Raw, which up until that point had been very boring, suddenly became a wild scene. During the main event of John Cena vs CM Punk, Wade Barrett came down to ringside. Suddenly, the rest of the Season 1 rookies jumped the barricade and surrounded the ringside area. They beat up Luke Gallows and CM Punk, laid waste to Cena, beat up the commentary team, assaulted backstage staff, choked Justin Roberts with his own tie, and tore apart the ring. They destroyed everything. It was one of the most effective and coolest angles that WWE had done in years. In one angle, the Nexus became the hottest faction since the NWO in 1996. It was reported that WWE felt the segment was a home run, and it got incredible fan feedback from those still watching the product. It wasn't perfect, of course. Daniel Bryan got fired for it. The group had been told to go out there and cause havoc, but Brian Danielson did a little too much havoc. Though there were reports that him spitting on John Cena led to him getting fired, it was ultimately the choking of Justin Roberts with his own tie. What it boiled down to was WWE promised its advertisers a PG show, and that part of the angle was not PG. Thus, they needed a scapegoat, and Danielson became that scapegoat. He was fired personally by Vince McMahon, which led a lot of people thinking it was a work, and it did feel like the wheels were already in motion to bring him back once the heat had died down. While the angle could be argued as part of the storyline of the first season, therefore justifying the humiliation, another reported reason for the formation of the Nexus was to try and bump the NXT ratings, which had been falling across the 15-week season. The show had started with a 1.35 rating and 1 1.7 million viewers, but that fell to a 0.86 and 1.1 million viewers by the end of the 15 weeks, though the final did see a little boost. Dave Meltzer wrote in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, one of the company's key goals is to rebuild the NXT ratings, because at a point eight, they really aren't all that valuable to sci-fi. But at a 1.2, they are, and the weekly TV rights fees are an important part of the budget. Sadly, the Nexus did not translate into more people watching season two of NXT. The Miz was our only returning pro, being joined by Kofi Kingston, Cody Rhodes, MVP, Mark Henry, John Morrison, Zack Ryder, and Lay Cool, who were there to be this season's Let's Make Fun of the Internet Marks gag as they were paired with Kaval, the former ROH champion Low Key. The pair would call the former TNA X Division champion Teeny Tiny and make him wear a t-shirt that said he was the property of Lay Cool. You'll be surprised to learn this did not get him over. Similarly, there were little lessons learned in celebrating family connections from previous wrestling history. The show featured the son of Kurt Hennig, who had wrestled in FCW as Joe Hennig and had him renamed to the rather unwieldy Michael McGillicutty and told him to not wrestle like his dad, which is what he'd been doing previously. Worse was Wyndham Rotunda, given the name Husky Harris, a not-so-subtle dig at his body size. The man who would later create magic in wrestling under the Bray Wyatt gimmick would make reference to WWE's treatment of his weight with the Husk as the Pig Boy puppet and the Muscle Man dance. The rest of the season was rounded out with Titus O'Neil, Percy Watson, Alex Riley, Eli Cottonwood, and arguably one of the worst wrestling names I've ever heard, Lucky Cannon. Much like the first season, the rookies were made to do ridiculous challenges designed to make them look as stupid as possible, with a Talk the Talk segment promo about mustaches that killed the career of poor Eli Cottonwood. Whereas this is a very good point. <laughs> what is a mustache? <laughs> well, it's a little bit of hair growing on your upper lip, and I don't have a mustache, <laughs> and nobody else here has a mustache. But I think that I have the best moustache out of anyone here. And none of it translated into viewers. The debut episode of season two got 1.53 million viewers, one of the highest ratings likely from the Nexus angle, but by the end of the 12 weeks had fallen back down to 1.1 million and a 0.88 rating, which was below the sci-fi average. The shorter season saw Kaval win, but the excitement of seeing any of the rookies joining the Nexus had been dashed, 
because the group had already lost all of that momentum. The group, who'd been such a dominating force, had their first big pay-per-view match at SummerSlam 2010, where they took on Team WWE of John Cena, R-Truth, John Morrison, Chris Jericho, Edge, Bret Hart, and a returning Daniel Bryan, announced as a replacement for the great Khali, to the delight of everyone who likes to watch good wrestling. Oddly, WWE went to great lengths to keep the news of Bryan coming back a secret, up until 40 minutes before the match, and then they just posted on Twitter that he'd be the surprise entrant for Team WWE. Things didn't start well for this new group when two of the Nexus were eliminated in the first four minutes of the match. Bret Hart DQ'd himself to be eliminated because he couldn't take bumps. Daniel Bryan was eliminated via interference from The Miz. And Super Cena survived a two-on-one beatdown and a DDT on concrete to eliminate both men and declare a win for Team WWE. Reportedly, the decision had been made that WWE did not want to make seven new guys or even a new group just two key players in Wade Barrett and Skip Sheffield. Both Edge and Jericho have gone on record saying they actively pushed for Nexus to win the match, but the company felt it was more important to protect their established stars like Cena than give the Nexus any credibility. There have been some conflicting reports, rumor and innuendo, that Cena himself pushed to win the match, but that has since been clarified that he only pushed for the concrete spot, and it was a Vince McMahon call for him to win the match from 2-1 down. If you want to relive this pay-per-view in audio form, you can listen to myself and Oliver Davis review it in all of its terrible glory over at patreon.com forward slash WrestleTalk. The following month, Barrett got his prize for winning the first season of NXT, a shot at any title he wanted, and he cashed that in for Night of Champions 2010 against WWE Champion Sheamus in a match that had four other guys. He did not win. Caval, for the record, cashed in his title shot opportunity on the Intercontinental Championship at that year's Survivor Series. He lost, and then was released one month later. In a change for its third season, NXT would be an all-women lineup. But that wasn't the only thing about the show that was going to change. Chapter 3. Season 3 and Season 4 and Season 5. In April 2010, WWE and Sci-Fi announced that SmackDown would be moving to their channel starting from that October. The shows that SmackDown would bump on Friday nights were moved to Tuesdays, and because they were getting better ratings, they replaced NXT, which was bumped entirely. This meant that NXT no longer had a TV home, and although Variety reported that WWE were shopping the show around, they couldn't find a network that would pick it up. Because WWE were trying to find a new station, the original idea of doing a split male and female season was scrapped in favor of doing an all-women one because they felt the freak show nature of it might attract networks, especially as the show was going to be built around Alocia, better known as Isis the Amazon. However, just before the show started, erotic photos of her surfaced online and WWE pulled her from the show. She was replaced with eventual winner Caitlyn, who joins Naomi, AJ, Aksana, Maxine, and Jamie. Fun fact, the rumored lineup for season three, if it did have men, would have included Xavier Woods, Bo Rotunda, AKA Bo Dallas, Wes Briscoe, Richie Steamboat, and Mason Ryan, who coincidentally would later join CM Punk's new Nexus lineup. The other reported reason to do an all-female show was because of a lot of unhappiness with the current crop of WWE Divas over SummerSlam weekend, particularly after Tiffany got arrested for getting into a fight with then-husband Drew McIntyre, and Serena Deeb was photographed intoxicated in public, which not only went against her sobriety gimmick in CM Punk's Straight Edge Society, but also tarnished the wholesome family-friendly look WWE was trying to portray. So the idea with this season of NXT was, let's find a way to replace all the women. Though there were reports that WWE might do a shorter six-week season, this NXT run ended up being split between the first five episodes airing on Sci-Fi and the rest moving to a webcast for those in the US. By this point, all pretense that this was about creating new stars for WWE was completely gone. Though some of the names in the series would go on to big things, namely still with the company and AJ Lee became one of WWE's most popular female stars in the mid-2010s, it's not because of their time on NXT. Cole's heel shtick got to a point where he had a gong at ringside that he would hit when he saw something he didn't like, which was often. He cut a promo on the way to the ring saying that this show was lowbrow and insulting his journalistic integrity. And during a limbo contest, yes, I am being serious, he remarked, this contest is very symbolic of this show. How low can we go? 
They did a wedding angle between Aksana and Goldust for a green card. The whole thing was mean-spirited and unpleasant. And again, there was no real business rationale for presenting the show in such a way. Caitlin would later say, It was terrifying. I had an ulcer in my stomach every week before the show because they were putting us on the spot. We had no preparation and it was very scary. You'd think that this would be the end of NXT. After all, the show is now a webcast with no TV home. The problem was that NXT did have a TV home internationally, so they had to keep making shows. Michael Cole was replaced by Todd Grisham for the fourth season as lead commentator, and any arguments that Cole's commentary was being done just because he's a heel fell apart when Grisham did all the same things. It's almost as if Michael Cole was being fed lines to bury the talent, but who would possibly do such a thing like that? And it wasn't just the commentary team. Derek Bateman, later EC3 and TNA, was accused of breaking the rules, and when questioned about it, responded, Dude, it's NXT. Who cares? Johnny Curtis, later Fandango, won the series where the prize was he and his pro would challenge for the tag titles. But sadly for Curtis, R-Truth turned heel shortly after the season was over, and so the pair never got that shot. But Curtis would eventually cash in to get that tag title shot, tagging with former NXT contestant Michael McGillicutty. 19 months later, they lost. The gimmick of the fifth season was redemption. People who failed to win NXT the first time round getting another shot at glory, or joke telling, whatever the show is about at this point. It certainly wasn't about the wrestling anymore. Much like the wedding angle that is the most remembered thing from season three, NXT season five featured a love triangle soap opera storyline between Curtis Bateman and Maxine. And because the show was so far removed from being a wrestling show, it developed somewhat of a cult following from people who just enjoyed how silly it had become. Yoshi Tatsu and Tyson Kidd, who weren't even part of the rookie lineup, had an acclaimed feud over an action figure of all things. Hilariously, the format of the show had also fallen apart. At a certain point, the pros just stopped appearing altogether, and instead the show was filled out with lower mid-card acts like JTG, Trent Beretta, Kurt Hawkins, and Tyler Rex. Jacob Novak was eliminated in week 11, Byron Saxton was eliminated in week 13, Lucky Cannon was eliminated in week 15, Conor O'Brien was eliminated in week 17, and then Darren Young, one of the final three, was suspended in week 29, brought back in week 35, and the show just ended in week 59 with no other eliminations and no actual winner. I guess technically Derek Bateman was the winner. Both Darren Young and Titus O'Neil were called up to SmackDown and there was no one else for him to compete against, so he won with the two sweetest words in the English language. Default. On the final episode, a commercial aired for a new NXT the following week, and that was it. The original NXT was dead. So what happened? Chapter 4 – The Death of the Original NXT Clearly, WWE still had plans to keep NXT going after the Redemption series, as they filmed vignettes and a promo video for a sixth season of the show to air in July 2012, which would have featured Big E, Bo Dallas, Damian Sandow, Jinder Mahal, Hunico, Leo Kruger, Xavier Woods, and Seth Rollins. But behind the scenes, some big changes were happening within WWE. Stephanie McMahon had become Executive Vice President of Creative within the company in 2007, and her power had been steadily growing since that time. The same was true of her husband, Triple H, who had an office at WWE Stamford HQ and was given the title of Executive Senior Advisor in 2010. The following year, he was promoted to become Executive Vice President of Talent and Live Events, which meant his remit included talent development. Prior to that, the responsibility had been done by John Laurinaitis, who first joined the company as a road agent following WWE's purchase of WCW in 2001. By June 2004, he took over from Jim Ross as head of talent relations and kept that position for seven years. It was right around the time that he became an on-air authority figure in the summer of 2011, after being mentioned in Punk's Pipe Bomb promo that his actual power behind the scenes was diminishing. Laurinaitis had been criticized in some quarters for his approach to talent development during his tenure. He showed little interest in scouting talent from the indies, focusing instead on developing collegiate athletes, and was considered by many to advocate too much of a cookie-cutter approach in how these new recruits were trained. Jim Cornette, who was in charge of OVW when that was a developmental territory for WWE, was particularly critical of John Laurinaitis' approach, and there were similar claims made about how talent was being brought up through FCW, which was another developmental territory. Triple H agreed with some of these criticisms, because he immediately started instigating changes when he took over the reins from Laurinaitis in the summer of 2011. 
he started to make his moves. First doing a quiet under the radar FCW show at Full Sail, then started the process of signing talent from the independent scene like Chris Hero, Claudio Castagnoli, and John Moxley. By the summer of 2012, Triple H had closed FCW and moved their developmental system to Full Sail using the NXT branding. And because WWE still had those international deals to air NXT, that became the new weekly show. The show then moved to the WWE Network when that was launched in 2014, and the rest is history. That is why, ultimately, the redemption season was ended, the sixth season of the game show style NXT was dropped, and those three letters relaunched as the developmental system that became so lauded for the rest of the 2010s. So who really killed the original NXT? Well, the literal answer is Triple H, as he was the one to abandon the game show format in favor of doing, essentially, FCW and OVW, but with different letters. But it can be argued quite easily that the format was already over and needed someone to pull the trigger. And much like WWECW, NXT was dead from the very start. For whatever reason, the feeling was making fun of the rookies and making them look stupid would get them over in the long run, and that did not work. Having the rookies do humiliating challenges and making them look dumb on TV did, in fact, not make any new stars. It also didn't attract viewers, and those viewers might have got them a better TV rights deal. And that all comes back to Vince McMahon. He was the one who had the grand vision to show another side of WWE that you've never seen before. And he either got bored of that very quickly and decided cheap laughs were better entertainment, or he forgot entirely what the point of the show was. It can also be argued that Vince's decision to have Cena go over the Nexus at SummerSlam 2010, and for Barrett to not win the WWE Championship in the other various times he tried also killed NXT's chances of being taken seriously. So although Triple H pulled the trigger, he was shooting something that had already been killed. And in its wake rose a phoenix of black and gold. I wonder what happened to that show? Thank you so much for watching. Please do head on over to patreon.com forward slash rest because that support really helps us make this show. And if you want to watch more like this, check out the video we did on who really killed WWECW.